not content to preach the gospel uh, to people who've already heard, but to spread the gospel around the world. May we have a similar passion within our circles of influence or around the world, Lord, that we would preach your truth and share the gospel, the truth that you love people and you desire to have a relationship with them. And it's in Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. Well, it's a delight to be together again today, and uh, I wasn't in the pulpit last week um, because Pastor Sam Polson was here, and we had a wonderful, a wonderful conference on prayer, and I will tell you that if you were not able to come to the conference, all of the sessions are on our app, and so you can walk through, and, and Autumn did a beautiful job just putting them together on the app, so you can, you can experience uh, at least the teaching um, from Pastor Polson from last week, and I just I would commend that to you. Uh, Angie and I love watching America's Got Talent. Uh, it's a it's a show. If you don't know about it, it's a show that showcases incredible varieties of talent from across the country and around the world. Honestly, but I got to confess to you, those acts where knives are thrown at people make me squirm in my seat. I just I can hardly watch. I do, but I can hardly watch when these guys are throwing these knives at people. Why? Because they have, they just have one shot at hitting the right target, and if it could go wrong really quickly, right? And, and I even saw one episode where Simon Cowell kind of got nicked by a knife, and it freaked me out a little bit. I mean, a miss would be disastrous. It would be a big bloody mess, and so it kind of makes me a little bit nervous. But what drives them to perform such acts? Why would they do that? What, who in their right mind would wing knives at people? It just doesn't even make sense. What's, what compels them to do this? Is it the thrill? Is it, is it the fame that they might receive from this? Or is it just the spectacle of the whole thing? I mean, it's pretty entertaining, and I think they do it for the thrill and for the spectacle. But as followers of Christ, as we look at someone who is so compelled to do something, what I would say is kind of foolish and not really significant from an eternal perspective, what compels us to do what we're supposed to do? What compels us to, to share the gospel? What, what is our aim as followers of Jesus Christ? That's the title of the, of the sermon today, our aim with God's gospel. What is our aim? What are we supposed to be doing with the lives that he's entrusted to us? Because the stakes are a lot higher than throwing knives at people, isn't it? The stakes are eternal. And so because we are people of grace, we should have a, a special compulsion, a, a drive, if you will. Not for foolishness, for things that won't last, but for things that do last. We must be compelled as followers of Jesus Christ. We must be compelled to share the glory of Christ. That, 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 that needs to be our compulsion. That needs to be our aim. That, that, that's why we're here. And that really is the main thought I want to share with you this morning is God's grace, <clears throat> God's grace compels Christians to reach the unreached. It's God's grace that compels the Christian to reach those who do not know the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the essence of what Paul addresses in these verses, the, the profound transformation that occurs when you grasp the depths of God's grace. When, you, when we just sang about God's love, that, that, I mean, if every person on the earth were a scribe and, and, and we were trying to write out the love of God, we, would just, we wouldn't even come close to be able to love out, write out the love that God has for us and the grace that he's lavished upon us. What did you do to receive the grace of God? What did you do to receive that lavish gift that he bestows on you? And I think it's, Obvious, we did nothing. That's the essence of the name or the word grace, isn't it? Now, as we, as we delve into this, the heart of the sermon this morning, I want to explore three ex essential actions that this understanding should compel us to undertake in the reaching of the lost. 
We need to be compelled to reach the lost. And remember, so God's grace compels Christians to reach the unreached. And the first, the first uh, essential action is this, embrace the purpose of grace. We must embrace the purpose of grace, in verses 15 and 16. So Paul, after commending the church at Rome for their competency in the Scriptures, if you remember two weeks ago in verse 14, which Wesley read for us again, that he commended them for their capacity to be able to speak into one another's lives, to speak truth, to admonish, encourage, exhort one another. And, and he commended them for that and their, their, their wonderful ability to do that. And, and he reminds them, too, that they also, in the next few verses, need some admonishment as well. And, and, and he talks about some admonishment that, that's very important to them. And I want you to look at verse 15 to see what Paul says. He says, But on some points, I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace given to me by God. So Paul spoke the truth and love to this church in Rome. And the result of he speaking the truth and love to this church in Rome, the result of that is what we have been walking through since August 30th of 2020, when I started, embarked on the series of walking through the book of Romans. So we've been at it for a while, and we're coming to a close. Uh, and, and, and what was he so bold about? Well, he, I mean, just let me give you some reminders. He's, he's, through this letter, teaching them about the purpose of the church. He talks to them about sin, that Jews sin, that Gentiles sin, that everybody sins. He talks to them about the nation of Israel, the Gentile people a new people group that comes from the Jews and the Gentiles, the church. He talks about faith. It's always been about faith, even back to Abraham. He talks about the great love of God. He talks about walking in the flesh versus walking in the Spirit, chapters 7 and 8. He talks about, in chapters 9 through 11, how God isn't finished with the nation of Israel. He talks about being a living sacrifice to God. He talks about living in submission to the God-ordained government. And he, he talks about living without passing judgment on one another, also known as Christian liberty. So these are all these things that we've walked through are Paul's reminder, Paul's admonishment to the people at Rome, the church at Rome. And he boldly reminds them of these things. But what was Paul's motivation to remind them? Because God called them, God called him to the very special position of being an apostle. He was an apostle to, to uh, called of God, to the Gentiles in particular. In Romans chapter 15, 15, he says, But on some points I have written very boldly as a way of reminder because of the grace given to me. Paul became an apostle for no other reason than God saved a wicked sinner and purposed to put him in the ministry for God's good purposes. There wasn't something special about Paul. There wasn't something special about the nation of Israel. There's not something special about you. And there's not something special about me. It's all about God's grace and all about God's love. And God, by his grace, called Paul to be an apostle. And even Paul understood clearly who he was and that it was only by God's grace that he was now able to serve God with his life. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 9 and 10. He says, For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is in me. <clears throat> it's his grace. First Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 14, it says, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing to me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. What did Paul do to deserve salvation? 
nothing. What did Paul do to deserve being called to the office of apostle? Nothing. It was by God's grace. And that's what Paul's point here is in verses 15 and 16. Let me read it again. But on some points I have written to you very boldly, by the way of reminder, because of the grace given to me by God, to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God, so that the offering of the Gentiles, the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified, by the Holy Spirit. Well, what does that mean? Paul was, by the grace of God, redeemed, not just for his own personal benefit. Do you understand that? It wasn't just that God decided to place his favor on him just to pull him and, and, and give him a place in heaven. He had a greater purpose for the apostle Paul, didn't he? By the way, I would submit to you he has the same thing for you. Although you're not going to be an apostle, God has a purpose for each one of you that are called by his name. In fact, doulos Iesu Christu. Doulos Iesu Christu. Do you know what that means? Slave of Jesus Christ. He is a slave of Jesus Christ. That's what it means. Paul considers himself to be a slave of Jesus Christ. And that, those, those words sound so terrible to our ears, but to Paul, it was the highest privilege to be referred to as a slave, a, 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 sir, a, 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 a bond servant, a slave of Jesus Christ. This idea of slavery, it's, it's a rather binary thing, isn't it? it, it you're, either, you're either a slave to sin or you're a slave to Christ. That's really what it boils down to for us, right? In humanity, if I can boil it down to that one thought, people are either a slave to sin or a slave to Christ. That's true of us even today. Look at what Paul says. Look at what Paul says in Romans chapter 6, verses 18, 15 through 18. He says, what then? Are we to sin because we are not under the law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves to sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching with which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. It's a binary thing, isn't it? You're either this or you're that. You're either a doulos to harmartia or a doulos to Iesu Christu. Which are you? Are you a slave to sin or are you a slave to righteousness? Are you a slave to Jesus Christ? Paul was committed, a committed slave with a significant task to accomplish. One that was foretold in the Old Testament. He, he uses the ter term, you see this in the text, he uses the term priestly because he is, like, like in the Old Testament, viewing his role as a priest who makes an offering. Isn't that interesting? Look back at verse 16. To be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God. Right? So that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Now, that's an amazing statement, isn't it, from the Apostle Paul. He is saying, <laughs> excuse me, he is saying that he who is the Apostle to the Gentiles is going to the Gentiles to retrieve some of them for salvation. Those that he has retrieved are his offering to God. Isn't that interesting? He said, I'm going out and I'm retrieving these, these Gentiles and I'm offering them up. To God is an acceptable sacrifice. Just as the priest in the Old Testament gathered the sheep as an offering to God in, in, in what the Old Testament talks about in the sacrificial system, just as, just as a priest did that, so Paul gathered the sheep, a saved people, for God in the New Testament as an offering. So in that sense, he's functioning as a priest. And, and this is why we can echo Paul's sentiment in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. 
He says this, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. He's going out and he's getting the Gentile sheep, if you will, and he's appealing to the sheep. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. He's going to Jesus and saying, look at all these sheep that by your grace I've been able to bring to you who are offering their bodies as a living sacrifice to you. God used Paul to reach people for Christ who made, who God made in turn sanctified and holy for his glory. That's what God did with those people that Paul went out and got. And that's what he says here in this verse. God makes holy people through the power of his Holy Spirit so that God may receive glory upon glory. The more people that come to faith in Jesus Christ, the more glory the Lord receives. That's a beautiful thought, isn't it? Your salvation is about God's glory more than it is about your rescue. Can I say that again? Your salvation from eternal condemnation is more about God's glory than it is about your rescue from eternal hell. You need to understand that, right? And, 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 and so what happens? God saving you and making you holy should do something. What should it do? It should cause you to give glory to him. That's what it should do. He gets glory for your salvation. And Paul recognized his priestly privilege in this amazing process. God saved Paul so Paul would be a tool to reach others with God's glorious good news. And guess what, friends? You are not called to be a big A apostle. Did you know that? You're not a big A apostle. There's only uh, the, the apostles were part of the office of apostle. That office is closed now. But we are all small a apostles. Did you know that? You are. The word apostle means sent one. And you and I are sent out. And in that sense, we are apostles. We, we function apostolically in that small a sense. God's grace doesn't simply save us. God's grace makes us useful for his ministry. You are not saved to sit, my friends. You are saved to serve. That's, that's what God desires of us and is exampled in the life of the Apostle Paul. And there are two reasons that you should be compelled to reach others with the gospel. Number one, we get to be a part of rescuing people from eternal hell. You have the privilege of speaking truth into others' lives and rescuing them from eternal condemnation. Number two, we get to be part of creating more worshipers. We get to be a part of making more worshipers. Remember what John Piper said, missions is not the ultimate goal of the church. Worship is. Missions exists because worship doesn't. Now, worship exists around the world, doesn't it? Worship of self, worship of false gods. Worship exists, but proper worship around the world does not exist. Hence, missions. So, the question for you is, what compels you? What drives you? What is your purpose for living here on this earth as a follower of Christ? Are you driven and compelled by the American dream? Are you, are you compelled by the freedoms that you enjoy, which I do as well, in the United States of America? Is that your drive? Is that your passion? Are you driven to have a significant bank account and retire in ease and comfort? Is that, is that what drives you? Is your purpose pleasure at all costs, otherwise known as hedonism? Are these your drives? Are any of these falling into the category of your compulsions? What is the purpose of God's grace in your life? Is it just for your salvation? So you get a get out of hell free card and you can go to heaven and, and uh, be with Jesus for the rest of your life? That, is that what it's all about? You just you get saved and then you just wait for his return? And, and I mean, is that what it's all about? I just, I don't think it is. No. Or is there something more? Is there something more? Well, there is something much 
much more. God's grace compelled Paul to reach people for Jesus, and that should be true of you as well. God's grace doesn't just save you. God's grace should compel you to reach others for Christ and to serve Christ faithfully with the rest of your lives, regardless regardless of all the accoutrements that we might or might not enjoy in this life. We need to be careful about this. God's grace should compel us to serve Him, especially in reaching those in your life who are yet to be reached with the gospel. So, we need to embrace the purpose of God's grace in our lives. What is the purpose of God's grace? It's not just your salvation. It's your service. Number two, what else are we supposed to do? Magnify Jesus, the focus of your ministry. We are to magnify Jesus, who is the focus of your ministry. It's very easy for those who are serving God faithfully, like the Apostle Paul, for instance, It's very easy for those who are serving God faithfully to get their focus off and begin to think more highly of themselves than they ought to think, thinking that they are necessary for God to get His will accomplished. Newsflash. You are not necessary for God to get His will accomplished. You are not. I I love all of you, and I think you're wonderful, and you're fearfully and wonderfully made. But you are not necessary to get, have God or help God. He did, you weren't born and then God said, oh, finally. Finally. Now, at last, I can get my will accomplished because Dennis is born. <laughs> it's not how it works. He doesn't, if, if God needs anything, he ceases to be God. Understand that. If God needs anything, he ceases to be God. However, he, because of his grace, chooses to use his children for their good, for your good, and for his glory. He chooses to use. Can you imagine? The God of the universe desires to use the likes of us to get his will accomplished. So, we shouldn't magnify ourselves in God's work, but who should we magnify? Jesus Christ. That's who received that, who's, that is who should receive all of the glory. Look at verses 17 through 19. In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my works for God. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Holy Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. Our ministry is not about us. You can see that from the sentiment that Paul writes here. Our ministry is a a privilege given to us to represent Christ well and to give him glory. Now, I want you to see that Paul is proud of his work. Do you see that in the text? He says that. In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God. This isn't a sinful pride, that, that, that sinful pride that so easily gets us into so much trouble. No, think of it this way. Paul is satisfied with the work that he has accomplished on behalf of the Lord, recognizing that it was only possible through the power of the Lord to accomplish said accomplishments. So listen, please notice that, that even though he is proud of his work, he gives God all the glory. He gives God all the glory. Paul understands that anything of eternal value that he has accomplished was only possible and is only possible because of the God's power in and through him. It's only possible through God. We used to quote this verse every week, and here's just a portion of it. And I want you to notice this in Ephesians 3.20. He says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power, where? At work in us. He accomplishes amazing things through his people. We just can't be proud about it in the sense that look at what we did. We don't want to be like Herod, who when Herod is preaching and and they say, oh, the voice of a God and not of a man. And he's like, yeah, you're right. It's pretty true now that you mention it. And then the text says he was eaten by worms. So I don't recommend taking credit from God. 
Nebuchadnezzar did it in the Old Testament. Didn't work out well for him for seven years. I don't recommend taking credit from God, but we can be proud of the work that we've accomplished through the power of God because it's only through his power that we're able to accomplish anything of eternal value. Paul was proud of his work in Christ, and it is Christ that it is in Christ that he is empowered to accomplish amazing things, eternal things, and he did. He did. Paul accomplished amazing things. He just read the New Testament. Think about all the churches that he was either involved in planting or part of planting. Some scholars say up to 180 churches that he was involved in that. Paul wrote the theology of the New Testament. Paul's an amazing guy. But Paul says, listen, I'm proud of the work that I've accomplished, but it's only because of God. And I think that's really important for us to remember that, right? It's not because of who we are. It's because of who he is. Well, who is Christ? Who is Jesus Christ? Look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 18. It says, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. What does preeminent mean? He's in charge. There's none higher. Right? That's who Christ is. So how do we not become a menace in the ministry by becoming prideful in the work that we accomplish in the ministry? How do we, become not, how do we not become a menace? How do we serve God without becoming prideful and self-exalting? Well, first of all, understand it's a constant battle. It's a constant battle. But we can take a page from John the Baptist. If you remember with John the Baptist where his, his followers were starting to follow Jesus Christ and people were enamored with the ministry of Jesus Christ and they were starting to leave John's ministry and head to the ministry of Jesus Christ. And his disciples are like, hey, this is not cool. Uh, They're leaving us and they're going to follow Jesus, right? And John's like, you guys, do you not get this? Do you not understand that he's the reason I'm here? Do you not understand that I've been preaching for him to show up? And then what does he say in John chapter 3, verse 30? He says, oh, he must increase and I must decrease. Folks, underline that in your Bible. Write it out. Have it. Uh, uh, memorize that verse. He must increase in your life. You must decrease in your life. More of Jesus, less of me. So again, Paul makes it clear that, that, this, that this is only accomplished by and through the power of God. Look at verse 19. It says, by the power and signs and wonders, by the power of the Holy Spirit, so that from Jerusalem all the way around Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of God. Wow! He is saying... I've done it. I mean, he's, he's on the other side of ministry here, okay? And he's saying, I, I've done it. I, there's, you'll know Paul, and we'll see this in the rest of the book of Rome. He, the book of Rome, he has more to do, and he has more desires to accomplish. But right now he's saying, by God's grace, there's been a lot accomplished. By the power of Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I've been able to accomplish these things. The Spirit of God worked through Paul with signs and wonders. By the way, that's a sermon in and of itself. But Paul was endued with signs and wonders, thus authenticating his apostolic ministry. Do you understand that? He was doing spec- God was doing spectacular things through him, authenticating his apostolic ministry. We don't need signs and wonders today, folks. The apostolic ministry is gone. The word of God is complete. We don't need signs and wonders from apostles because that office is closed. We have the word of God, the sufficiency of the scriptures that tells us exactly what we need, why we need it, and what to do about it. And boy, we love signs and wonders, don't we? Oh, if God would just show up and do something special for me, then I'll believe. Blessed are those who do not see and yet believe. Right? We don't need signs and wonders. We have the wonderful Word of God that instructs us. The Spirit of God worked through Paul and authenticated his apostolic ministry so that the gospel went forth and accomplished what the book of Acts declared in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, which says, But you, disciples, will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Guess what you are in the ministry? 
Guess what you are in the ministry? And by the way, if you are a Christian, you are in the ministry. I have said this from day one that I have come here. My job is not to do the work of the ministry. And you're like, whoa. Okay, Mr. High and Mighty. It's not my job. It's your job. It's your job to do the work of the ministry. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 says, He gave some to be apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, uh, evangelists. Why? For the equipping of the saints to do what? The work of the ministry. You're a saint. You do the ministry. What's my job? Pastor, teacher, elder, to train you up to do the work of the ministry. That's my job. As a Christian, I'm to do the work of the ministry. So I have two hats that I need to wear. You have one hat. And you need to wear it well to do the work of the ministry. So I just want you to understand that. But, but guess what you are? Guess what you are in the ministry? Have you ever thought about this? You're a magnifying glass. That's what you are. What does a magnifying glass do? It magnifies things to make them more visible. When you want to read something that's too small, you grab a magnifying glass, which makes the letters appear larger so that you can read those letters. That's what you do in relation to Jesus. You magnify him. Your life is a magnifying glass that makes Jesus visible to the world so that they can see him. You may be the only Christ that someone ever sees. And if this axiom is true, what do people see when they look at you? What do they see when they look at you? Are you magnifying Jesus with your life? He's entrusted a ministry to you. And, and, and so we need to be working at recognizing I'm a magnifying, cla- uh, magnifying glass for Jesus. That's what I am. So how do we do that? Well, we need to understand that apart from Christ, we can do nothing of substance. So we need to pray daily. We need to pray daily. Pray daily with a focus on magnifying Jesus in your ministry and your personal life. You are in the ministry. And so you need, it's good reason for you to pray, isn't it? To be on your knees and say, whoa, I can't do this. I pray that prayer every day. Lord, I can't do this. So I need you to work through me. I would encourage you to pray that same prayer. Pray daily that God would be magnified through your life. Number two, service with love. Serve others with love. Mirroring Jesus. Compassion. Humility. Purpose in your life to serve others with no look for anything in return. And then number three, and this is important, because no one can do this for you. Only you can do this for you. Evaluate your motives. We're not to ascribe motive to people. That's not, we're, not, we're not given that privilege. That's God's job. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitfully wicked, uh, deceitfully sick and wicked. Who can know it? What does he say? I, the Lord, know the heart. God knows your heart, but I don't know your heart. So it's not my job to assign motive to you. But I need to check my motive, and you need to check your motive right? And so we want to check our motives and evaluate them. Why am I serving the Lord? Is it for my own self-exaltation? Is it so people think I'm really cool when they get to see me do this and do that? Is it because I want some power in the church and I want to be able to tell people what to do? What's your motive? You have to be careful to check your motive because it's not about you and it's not about me. It's about Christ. So God's grace compels us to reach the unreached. So we need to embrace the purpose of grace. It's not just to get us out of hell. It's actually to get us to serve the Lord Jesus Christ with the life that he's entrusted to us. It also is to magnify Jesus. It's not about us. It's not about us. Jesus is the focus of our ministry. And then number three, purpose, or pursue rather, the goal of the gospel. We need to pursue the goal of the gospel. Michael Hyatt, maybe some of you have heard of Michael Hyatt. He's the guru of goal setting. He, he's big into casting personal vision or organizational vision and setting goals and accomplishing vision. And those things are very important. It's even biblical. Where vision is lacking, people perish. 
And so it's something we need, to, we need to be pursuing, setting goals. And he's built a business on setting goals to accomplish vision. Whatever one's personal vision in or what or is or whatever one's organization vision is, he's, he's built a company around this very concept. Do you think God has a vision? Does God have a vision? What are God's goals? Does he have like a planner? You know, he's, oh, this, I'm going to accomplish these goals today. Does God have vision? Does God have goals? What is God's vision for his church? That's an interesting question. I wonder what God's vision is for his church. And by the way, you're his church. So what's God's vision for you? I think that's a fair question. What was Paul's vision for the gospel? What, what do you think the goals of the gospel are? Paul tells us his goal with the gospel. And I suspect that his goal with the gospel aligns with God's heart as well. Take a look at verses 20 and 21. It says, And thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation, but as it is written, those who have never heard, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. You see that? What's Paul's goal? What's Paul's, what's Paul's goal with the gospel? Well, Paul's goal for communicating the gospel, his, his ministry, was to reach those who had never heard the precious message of Jesus Christ. First of all, what's the sense of this word ambition? I was wondering about that when I was studying this. And it's aspiration, right? Paul has a particular aspiration with the gospel of Jesus Christ. By the way, I'll ask you that question. What is your aspiration with the precious news of the gospel? The Greek word that's used here is a verb, and it means to convey or to communicate the gospel. Gospel meaning good news. And so this verb here is, it's, it's my goal, or it's my ambition, or it's my aspiration to communicate the good news. So again, I ask you, what is your aspiration your goal in conveying the good news that Jesus Christ is the creator of all that is. He's the one who left heaven to live a sinless life, thus qualifying him to be the perfect sacrifice for sin, who died a substitutionary death for you. He substituted himself for you on the cross, the cruel cross, some 2,000 years ago. He was put to death by his own creation, to rescue his creation from eternal death. Then, after his death on the cross, which satisfied God's wrath against you, he rose from the dead, proving his power over not only his own personal death, but yours as well. He was the first fruits, according to 1 Corinthians 15, of the resurrection thus enabling you to be resurrected as well. So in other words, Jesus died for you, paying your sin debt to God, so you don't need to pay this debt in hell for all of eternity. Understand that. If you're not a believer here today, I want you to understand this, and I say it with a heart of love. You have offended God. You have broken his law over and over again, myriads of times. And the payment of breaking his law is eternal condemnation in hell. Eternal condemnation in hell. I'm not soft peddling that. I was watching some apologist online who was soft peddling that. No, it is eternal writhing in pain forever and ever because you have offended a holy God. But the love of God, but the love of God provided Jesus Christ to redeem you from eternal condemnation. And if you would, by faith, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and call upon him even in your seat right now, the promise of the scriptures is that you would be born again. And I would, I would even now, Ask those of you that are born again, pray for those that are not born again right now, that God's Spirit would move in their hearts and would convict them to help them fully understand their desperate need for the gospel. Because Jesus loves you, for God so loved the world that he gave his only unique Son, that whosoever believes in him 
trusts him will have everlasting life. Will not fall into condemnation, but have everlasting life. You can, in your seat right now, trust Christ and he will save you. Repent of your sins and trust him and he will save you. This is the gospel, my friends. This is that very good news. And so I ask you again, what is your aspiration for this glorious, life-giving, freedom-inducing good news? Do you aspire to keep it to yourself? Or do you aspire to share it with those who desperately need it? Do you aspire to know it so well that you can communicate it well? Oh, I'm, I'm not a pastor. I, I don't know how to do this. You can know how to do this. If you know enough to be saved, you know the gospel. And you can share that. And if you don't know how to share it, come and talk to me. I will be happy to teach you. I know there's other elders here that would be happy to teach you. Or others would be happy to teach you on how to do that. Do you aspire to make it part of your DNA? Is that your aspiration? You make it part of your DNA so that, that you naturally praise God in front of others because you have not gotten over what God has done for you? Where it just pours out of you because it's who you are? Listen, if it's not pouring out of you, if it's not welling up within you, you need to do a heart check because you're either walking in sin and, and you've been dulled to the beauty of the gospel or you're not a believer in Christ. Either case, you need to repent and get back on track with the Lord. And, he, and, and he's standing ready to hear from you. So what is your goal, your ambition, your aspiration with the precious good news from God? I know what Paul's is. The text is clear. It was his ambition to preach the gospel, to convey the gospel to those who need it most. But before we go any further with this, I, I want to be clear about something. Paul says that he preaches... The gospel. Do you see that? It's, it's a call. He, he calls out, kaluo. He calls out, right? He preaches the gospel. He speaks it forth. Paul doesn't say he lives his faith out in front of others in hopes that somehow that living out their faith in front of his faith in front of them, that it will transform them into a follower of Jesus Christ. That's not how it works. Yes, we need good examples, and we need to be good examples. Yes, we need to offer up a cup of cold water in the name of Jesus Christ. We need to do good things. But those actions will not save people. It may soften their heart for the gospel, but those actions will not redeem a soul. It won't. The gospel must be articulated. It must be articulated. Look at Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So faith comes from what? Hearing. And hearing through the word of Christ. You have to share the word of Christ so that people can be saved. You have to. You needed to hear the word of Christ, the gospel, in order to be saved. I did too. The fact of the matter is, is that Romans 1.16 tells us that we're not to be ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to first the Jew and also the Greek. It is the power, the dunamis, that, 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 that explodes in the hearts of people when they hear the truth of the word of God, and God changes them on the spot. That's only through God's power. That's not through your testimony. It's not through your actions. It's through the word of God. The word of God. So your friends and those in your circle need to hear the word of God as well. Paul's goal was to preach the gospel in places where Christ's name was not known. Paul was a church planter at heart. He desired to go to places where there was zero understanding of Christ. And as you think about it, you might understand why Paul felt this way. He would have a clear slate to work from, if you will, unadulterated from aberrant views of Christ or Christianity. He could preach and teach pure doctrine that would help the new church flourish and grow in grace and in truth. Maybe there are some of you in our midst, even today, that God is calling to this kind of missionary endeavor. Maybe even right now, the Lord is pulling on you to consider going to a place where Christ is not even known. We call it the 1040 window, where people have never heard of Christ. 
according to David Platt, over three billion people in over seven it, three billion people in over seven thousand people groups are currently unreached by the gospel. They are on the road that leads them to an eternal hell without even hearing how they can go to heaven. The term unreached does not mean just mean that people are lost. Unreached means that people don't have access to the gospel. It's not that they can hear or have heard the gospel, but they choo- and they choose not to believe it. It's that they can't even hear it because no one around them knows it. Here's a technical definition for the unreached. Unreached peoples and places are those among whom Jesus is largely unknown and the church is relatively insufficient to make Jesus known in its broader population without outside help. That's what it means to be unreached. And that was Paul's heart, to reach the unreached. So is the Lord calling you to this kind of ministry? Perhaps he is. I truly hope that there are some in our midst that would give their lives to the unreached category. I would love to be a church that is sending our people to the 1040 window and reaching people for Jesus Christ who've never heard the gospel. It would be a beautiful thing. The precious good news that that they would be saved from the wrath of God. And maybe God's convicting you of that right now. Don't ignore it. Don't ignore that conviction. Don't ignore what he might be doing and and desires to do through you. But what about those of us who God isn't moving to the 1040 window? What do we do? Well, even though we are in a churched area, I will tell you that the gospel witness is abysmally low. Churches are more interested, it seems, and I, I really has I don't like to throw stones at churches because I really like to pray for churches. But it seems that churches are more interested in nickels and noses, or to put it more crassly, butts in seats, than reaching the lost. And may that not be true of us. For example, I hear of churches that use pragmatic means in order to get people in their church, playing rock and roll music in a worship service to try to draw people in. How can we use the unholy to make someone holy? Does God really need these kinds of gimmicks to bring conviction on a soul and bring them to a saving understanding of the gospel? Absolutely not. No. By the way, this service is not geared towards the salvation of souls. This service today is not geared towards the salvation of souls. It's designed for worship. It's a worship service. You are here as the gathered body of Christ for one purpose, the deserved corporate worship of God. That's why you're here. Now, I'm going to share the gospel. I did share the gospel. I'll share the gospel every week because there's always going to be people here that don't know Jesus, and I want to invite them to know Jesus. But that's not the purpose of this service. The purpose of this service is to worship God. And when we leave this place, and I want you to hear this, when we leave this place, we enter into the mission field with the aspiration, with the goal, with the ambition to reach the lost. And when we do reach the lost for Christ, what do we do with them? We bring them here as new worshipers on Sunday to worship God. That's what we do. Evangelism is about creating new worshipers so our God can receive more glory, more honor, more praise, and more worship. Remember Piper's quote that I shared with you earlier? Missions is not the ultimate goal of the church. Worship is. Missions exist because worship doesn't. God has a mission for you and for the life that he's entrusted to you. He has a mission for you. Imagine this. God desires to use you to make more people who will worship him. God wants to use you to make more people who will worship him. Is there any greater calling that we have as humans than to worship God? Is there any other calling? No. There's no greater calling. And you and I then get to help others become worshipers, which is the greatest activity that they can do with their lives. 
So evangelism is more than rescuing people from eternal wrath, as wonderful and as noble as that is, it's far more. It's actually giving people the greatest of eternal purposes, worship of God who is the creator of all that is. So whether you eat, whether you drink, whatever you do, you do to the glory of God. So some of us are called to preach and reach the unreached, which was Paul's ambition. And we say amen and amen. And I hope there are many that come from this congregation that go out to reach the unreached. It's, I know Mark Talsman is nodding his head saying amen and amen. That's what we want. But some of you are called to reach the circle that God has placed us in. He's placed you in. All of us are to preach the gospel to all who would have ears to hear. And I want to encourage you with something this morning. While sharing the gospel should be your goal, it should be our goal as a follower of Christ, it's not just your goal. Did you know that? It's not just your goal. It's God's goal. It's God's goal. He is the first and the best missionary. Right? You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses, my witnesses, in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. It is God's goal to reach the world for Christ, and he will empower you and me to get it done. He doesn't need you and me, but he, it is his will to use us to reach others. So this morning, the big question is whether your aspirations for the gospel align with God's. Are your goals the same as his? Are your gospel goals the same as as his, because you will be my witnesses. That's what Acts 1 8 says. It doesn't say you might be my witnesses. Or I sure hope you're going to be my witnesses. He says, You will be my witnesses. C.S. Lewis said this The church exists for nothing else but to draw men into Christ, to make them little Christs. If they are not doing that, all the cathedrals, clergy, missions, sermons, even the Bible itself, are simply a waste of time. God became a man for no other purpose. For no other purpose. So if you know what God's goal is with the gospel, and that, that he will empower you to get it done, are you, in fact, accomplishing the preaching, speaking forth, the sharing of the gospel? Are you accomplishing God's purpose in your life? Are you speaking the truth about people's sin and their need for a savior? It astonishes me. Every time people come, people that are new to our church and they say, I can't believe you talk about hell. I can't believe you talk about sin. That's what the Bible talks about. And you got to get them lost before they can be saved. We don't just add Jesus to our lives and hope for the best. They need to know they're lost. So when you're sharing the gospel, you need to share with them the bad news that they're in trouble with a holy God and that the only resolution for that trouble is Jesus Christ. We have to speak the truth so that people will be freed. The truth will set us free. So are you speaking the truth about people's sin and their need for a Savior? Do you have the same goal that God has regarding the gospel? Are you compelled to reach the unreached or at least those within your circle of influence? I hope that you are. Listen, we're talking about my circle training again in a few weeks, November 5, and we're going to talk about practical ways to do this, but I just want to remind you, it's not a, it's not a difficult process. Pray for one person that you know in your life. Pray for them every day that they would come to know Jesus Christ. Start with prayer. Number two, talk to them once a week. Just build a relationship with them. You don't need to talk about the gospel. Just build a relationship with them. And then number three, purpose once a month to share the gospel with them. To intentionally share the gospel with And see what God might do through you if you purpose to embrace your purpose of bringing people to Jesus Christ. I appreciate what Sharae has done uh, over at the college. I love having the front row filled with these people and their missionaries at GVSU sharing the gospel, sharing, sharing the truth of Jesus Christ. I just praise God for what he's doing through Sharae and through Terrence. And, and it's just exciting to see young people hungry for the things of God. May we all be hungry to do the will of God. We need to 
understand that God's grace compels Christians to reach the unreached, to embrace. We must embrace the purpose of grace. It's not just to get us out of hell. Grace is to set us apart to do the work of the ministry. And while we do that, we need to magnify Jesus, not ourselves. And we need to pursue the goal of the gospel. Paul's goal was to reach the unreached. What's your goal? What is your goal? My friends, I cannot stress enough how vital it is for each one of us to engage in regular regular pursuit of people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'll leave you with this quote from C.S. Lewis. I'm sorry, from C.H. Spurgeon. He says this because, because we need to listen to what he has to say. He reminds us that while it's our aim to preach the gospel to all creatures, it was God's idea first. And he will give us the power to hit his target consistently. Look at what Spurgeon says. He says, now the minister has a, pow- has, has a power given him of God to be considered both the father and the mother of those born of God. For the apostle said he travailed in the birth for souls till Christ was formed in them. What can we do then? We can now appeal to the Spirit. I know I have preached the gospel, that I have preached it earnestly. I have I challenge my master. So he's saying, I've preached the gospel, but now I challenge my master, God, to honor his own promise. He has said, it shall not return unto me void, and it shall not. It is in his hands, not mine. I cannot compel you, but oh, the Spirit of God, who has the key of the heart, may he compel you. And I'll leave you with this. Are you compelled by God to reach more people of God, more worshipers for God? Spurgeon said, have you no wish for others to be saved? Then you are not saved yourself. Be sure of that. Father, I pray that you would open our hearts and Lord, give us the passion that the Apostle Paul has to reach people for Jesus, whether it be the unreached in the 1040 window or the unreached next door. Lord, we need to follow your mandate to seek and to save that which is lost. Lord, for those here today that do not know you, I pray that today would be the day of their salvation and that they would be worshipers in the truest sense. And Father, for those of us that know Christ, may we repent of our apathy and become the evangelists, the preachers of your word that you've called us to be. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.